What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Yuri Degaya is a partner at BTC Reserve HQ, a premier Bitcoin brokerage, founder at Liquidity HQ, host of the Citadelium podcast, and author of many notable pieces, including the sensational essay, Bitcoin as a Tool for Succession, published in Citadel 21, Volume 4. He is a Bitcoiner and a builder of Citadels. Welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, Yuri. How are you? Thank you, Cedric, for inviting me. I'm doing really well. Oh, great. That's great to hear. You know, um, before we kind of get into, you know, a, a lot of your writing and, and more about who you are, let's just kind of get some background on, on what is, uh, you know, BTC Reserve and, and, and liquidity. Sure. Uh, well, I, uh, I started uh, in Bitcoin about uh, 2012, late 2012, and my kind of first uh, passion and my first uh, occupation, so to speak, in Bitcoin was brokerage. So uh, I've gone through uh, multiple iterations of that uh, of that business, and I ended up re- uh, founding a uh, company called uh, uh, L2B Global, which is now uh, uh, rebranded as of January uh, 2020 Bitcoin Reserve. So Bitcoin Reserve is essentially a Bitcoin brokerage firm that allows uh, uh, users, uh, namely uh, European Union uh, clients, uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin with us. We're a Bitcoin-only company. We don't do anything else uh, besides Bitcoin, uh, although we do support some uh, uh, stable coins because uh, for us, it's simply just another means of uh, receiving uh, and sending fiat, right? Like US dollars right. or euros. Yeah. And I'm also interested in other... Bitcoin technologies, as you know, uh, Bitcoin, uh, the, the main chain, the main layer of Bitcoin is uh, quite limited in what it can do, uh, which is a, a good and a bad thing in, in bad thing in terms of a user experience, but a good thing in terms of security of the Bitcoin network. So uh, people are starting to invent uh, new ways of moving uh, money around and uh, they are coming up with uh, so-called layer two technologies uh, and liquid uh, the liquid network is a sidechain technology that is uh, uh, essentially uh, an upgrade to the Bitcoin network. It's a federated sidechain that can uh, do uh, things that the uh, main chain cannot really do. And um, liquidity is a tool that allows you to move Bitcoin uh, to the liquid network and out of the liquid, net, liquid network as well as uh, exchange some assets that can be issued on the liquid network. So that's the short rundown. Sure. What kind of activity do you see on the liquid network? Well, uh, essentially liquid network is uh, designed to do a few things. The first thing is uh, to send and receive Bitcoin uh, faster than on chain because uh, the liquid network doesn't really have miners. So it's a federated uh, side chain, right? So it's a federation of uh, businesses around the world that are independent, but work together to essentially process transactions. So the block time, uh, on the liquid network is uh, only one minute as opposed to 10 minutes on average on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that allows you to move Bitcoin literally in one minute. And it's not variable. It's always one minute. It cannot be like one and a half sometimes and sometimes 30 seconds like on the Bitcoin network. So you're always sure. And um, another advantage is that um, if you know uh, anything about Bitcoin, you know that the Bitcoin blockchain is a public uh, thing, right? So you can see the movement of money from one address to another, and you can also see the amounts that are moved. On um, the Liquid Network, uh, the amounts that are moved are hidden by default. They are called confidential transactions. And uh, that allows for a certain degree of privacy to people who uh, trade large amounts or move large amounts of money around. For example, if you're a large trader, you want to move uh, money from one exchange to another, say from Bitfinex to Bitsy, uh, you would use a, uh, you would move a Bitcoin on the liquid network instead of the main chain and you will gain, uh, by that action, you will gain two advantages. First one is your move will be very fast within literally a couple of minutes. And the second is that uh, the uh, third party observers who usually observe the Bitcoin network, they will not be able to tell how much money you moved and what kind of asset you moved, right? So that gives a, a, a big advantage to you. Um, it, it's kind of a famous thing on the Bitcoin network that there are all kinds of Twitter bots out there who 
um, uh, who notify everybody else. Uh, um, one of those bots is called the whale alert. Uh, and it uh, literally every time someone moves a, a more or less significant amount of money, the whale alert bot uh, notifies everybody on Twitter. Okay, this user moved uh, this much money from Bitfinex to this exchange. Right. And, you know, um, if, you, if you're if you more dedicated, uh, you know, in terms of uh, snooping around, you can actually figure out more details about the user, right? Uh, like the IP address, location, what all kinds of things, yeah, which is a, a hindrance to privacy. So uh, Liquid Network uh, really, really helps uh, uh, with that regard. Uh, and uh, not not to speak about uh, issued assets, you can issue all kinds of assets uh, on the Liquid Network natively, uh, unlike some other you know uh, mm -hmm. blockchains where you have to create all kinds of uh, complicated things like smart contracts. Uh, on the Liquid Network, you just do it literally with one command and it's issued natively and, and super easy to do. Um, which uh, you know, which is not always. Uh, uh, good in terms of because because it's also coming kind of an open network right anybody can use it and obviously we've seen lots of scams on the uh, on other networks uh, such mm -hmm. as ERC20 scams people literally you know uh, the saying goes if you give a person uh, 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 an ability to print money he will print money and <laughs> a lot of people have done that in the past so liquid uh, kind of allows to do that thing as well but uh, more natively, uh, and uh, just because it's issued, something is issued on Liquid. That's kind of my, you know, warning to everybody else. Just because it's issued on Liquid, just because Blockstream is involved, and just because it's a Bitcoin sidechain, does not mean that there will be no nefarious actors out there. So uh, yeah, take care. Yeah, everyone's a scammer. Um, but yeah. I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm really excited about those technologies. I wasn't trying to infer anything scammy about those technologies, but you know, definitely, you know, do your own research and try to understand what you're using. Uh, I really want to start digging into, you know, just from the beginning of your work, because um, I think you've been very transparent, very honest, uh, and really, you know, a truth seeker. And, and the first one I want to touch off on is um, a piece, you know, how to deal with imposter syndrome and, and what do you do mm -hmm. if you feel out of place and, and sort of uneasy about your maybe favorable uh, circumstances or you feel unworthy? How does someone deal with that? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, you read the article, I guess, it just comes from personal experience, right? Uh, I always had this feeling that, you know, I'm probably not in the right place because uh, uh, all these people have, uh, you know, uh, succeeded at something, they are so successful, and uh, here I am. And uh, that's pretty much uh, what uh, the imposter syndrome is. It, uh, it kind of tells you, there's a voice in your head that tells you that you're not worthy of being where you are and what you have achieved. And um, I think the best way to fight it is just to, uh, first of all, uh, understand that such a thing exists, right? And then accept it uh, for, for what it is. And then uh, if you study some of the um, uh, stoic philosophers out there, um, I think it really helps because it allows you to uh, adopt a new um, view of the world, a new view on, uh, on, the li on life itself, right? It just... Uh, kind of tells you, you know, accept uh, the world for what it is, accept things for what they are, and you'll have only control over the things that are uh, in your immediate uh, control, and you cannot really stress about things that are outside of your control. So that's the, the basics of the Stoic philosophy, and uh, I think the main thing here is to really start uh, uh, viewing yourself from, uh, from um, you know, like a third person, and basically evaluating where you are and what you have done and maybe even comparing yourself to others uh, from that point of view because that allows you a glimpse of uh, of where you are because uh, if you if you uh, look at yourself this way you kind of see that uh, well you know what um I'm already at this stage of development and there's uh, so many people out there on earth you know almost 8 billion people and I'm really, really uh, not where they are. I'm really probably, uh, I don't want to say higher than they are, <laughs> but uh, more more developed in terms of uh, certain things, right? And um, that's not uh, that's not a bad thing because uh, I actually put some work into this, right? This I'm not uh, I'm not here because uh, I uh, ended up here by chance. I actually did some work to gain this. This is my proof of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you recognize your proof of work, you recognize that you actually deserve where you are and you deserve uh, your position. But you also have to keep in mind that uh, there's also um, an unlimited uh, way up or forward, right? 
there is a there's unlimited uh, amount of development that you can still do and that uh, just because you find yourself where you are does not limit you uh, you you still have a way to go and most likely you'll just keep developing uh, and uh, you know uh, building your uh, inner and outer world until the rest of your life that's how life is uh, and uh, uh, i believe that um, a person who stops developing at a certain point is pretty much dead, right? Because only death can stop you from developing. Uh, other than that, there's an unlimited amount of uh, uh, directions that you can take, things you can learn, and uh, uh, just, just you know, ways you can develop yourself. Yeah, I, I, I think that's something I really love about your work, that sort of, that internal exploration, that, that internal and external exploration that I think you've been very honest about uh, through your writings. And, and I, the two pieces I linked together there is, is sort of the imposter syndrome and, and how to deal with like, I don't feel I'm worthy. And then kind of like, well, well, maybe I do feel I'm worthy and, and where is this going? And, and what can I imagine, you know, what can I kind of think about internally about the external world? So like, what, what is like, you know, like, uh, would I be ready to be a billionaire, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and what does it mean to be a billionaire? And, and what, what do you think it means, you know, to be a billionaire? What is that really about? Yeah, yeah, because um, I I did have conversations with some of my friends about that. And uh, obviously, you know, a a lot of people uh, who think about money, they are uh, thinking big, right? They want, okay, I want to become a millionaire or even bigger. I want to become a billionaire. Uh, And uh, I've heard uh, some of my friends tell me that directly. And uh, uh, I started thinking about it because... uh, to me, it was, okay, what, what, what do you mean by uh, I want to be a billionaire? What does a billion dollars give you that you don't have right now, right? Is it a bigger yacht or is it a bigger apartment or, okay, now you have a big house. Now you have a big yacht. Now you have a, you know, a trophy wife. <laughs> what, what are you going to do next? Uh, is there, is, you know, a stop? Uh, and what I realized is that there is basically no stop to material things if you there is no stop. Uh, as soon as you acquire one, you will need the other, uh, another one, right? A better one, or um, uh, as I like to think about it, not a better one because better ones don't exist. A different one, right? And there's an unlimited amount of different ones out there. So you will never be satisfied if you're under, if you're after uh, material possessions. And uh, that's exactly why uh, I think a lot of people who dream about being a billionaire, they're they don't really realize what they want to be uh, to to get, but at the same time, uh, this uh, this uh, amount of money, this amount of material possessions, bring lots of problems into your life as well. Because if you if you if you heard this uh, kind of uh, 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 evaluation of life, I guess uh, they say that the poorest people who live, you know, in some uh, Asian countries who are like the fishermen who live in very, very poor villages are the happiest people in the world because they simply have no possessions. They just enjoy their life. They, they go out in the sea and they fish and they enjoy the freedom of, uh, of uh, everyday, you know, simplicity, yeah, essentially. And uh, uh, that got me thinking too. And uh, I, uh, I, I understood that uh, all these material possessions, they bring a lot of problems. Um, some people say that uh, rich people don't have problems. They do have problems and they actually have more problems and they are just different problems. Yes, of course, they don't have the problem of putting food on their table. They have plenty of food. But with that, they have uh, other problems like, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, friends you haven't talked to who appear in your life and suddenly you want to be friends again. A bunch of family members, a bunch of people who simply want your money, right? Uh, there's... Uh, uh, there's uh, all kinds of trouble just because you have more money, right? Or just because you are visible in terms of, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, where you are in, in your monetary uh, uh, wealth. I think uh, that uh, uh, people have to reevaluate that. And uh, when they think about uh, being a billionaire, I'm not saying that being a billionaire is bad. I'm just saying that if you are a billionaire, what are you going to do with your wealth? Is it just uh, for material pleasures and material possessions? Or are you going to really do something? Because I think you can do lots of amazing things with billions of dollars, right? Mm. Uh, Like when I start thinking about it, all I want to do, all I want to do with my capital is apply it to uh, build something, to Mm. make something happen. And 
uh, most likely, like I have done in the past, I will fail many, many times, but there will be probably some uh, thing or a few things that will actually succeed. And it will be amazing to see that uh, uh, I created something that people love and people need and uh, that makes people's uh, lives better. So I think that's what it's really about. It's not really about just, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, sending a message to everybody else about your status and just saying, I, I'm a billionaire and you're not. Yeah, I, I think those are sharp words. You know, speaking of tools, you know, money's a tool. And like you said, you know, I mean, you know, if money's a tool, then like with a hammer, you can build with it or you can crush and destroy things with it. I mean, give a hammer to a two-year-old and they're not going to build much. Um, but it is kind of a good experiment to give a hammer to a two-year-old and let them destroy some things and see what their, their power is. Um, exactly. And, you know, like CK Snarks always says, you know, iron sharp, sharpens iron. So, you know, how do you think uh, Bitcoin uh, makes you know, people better? Yeah, um, well, I think uh, the main concept here that uh, was popularized by Saifedina Moose is uh, low time preference. And I think that's uh, what Bitcoin does exactly. And uh, it may not uh, seem significant uh, to, to someone who just comes across this concept for the first time, but I actually... I think this is a life-changing concept. It's pretty much uh, what everything hinges upon in the world. It's uh, uh, if, if, if you don't know yet that uh, then uh, low time preference or just the time preference, the concept of time preference uh, comes from economics. And just uh, um, it's about uh, you uh, wanting to either do something or forego something uh, and do, do it in the future at, you know, uh, with a better result, I guess. Um, the, the, famous, uh, the famous experiment, uh, the marshmallow experiment with kids uh, shows time preference really, real well when uh, kids were given uh, marshmallows and said, okay, you can get this marshmallow uh, right now, or uh, if you don't eat it right now, in, in half an hour, we'll give you two marshmallows, right? And that, uh, you know, that kind of showed how many kids had the self-control to, to wait for mm. half an hour or uh, how many of them ate it, right? That's what time preference is about. And uh, Bitcoin does it naturally because uh, it, ha it, uh, it has, uh, you know, this uh, uh, number go up technology, so-called, uh, baked into the protocol. Uh, it uh, pretty much is designed to pump forever. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not here to actually pump Bitcoin. I'm just uh, stating the fact. I'm just stating what, what's, uh, what people don't understand because they, uh, a lot of people in Bitcoin, they still think that it's just an investment. It's not an investment. It's uh, literally a reinvention of money. And uh, uh, it's uh, the first time uh, that the uh, money was invented with a completely limited supply. And that limited supply with, uh, uh, combined with other uh, advantages of Bitcoin, uh, it gives it lots and lots of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, ways to go. And I think that uh, Bitcoin will be pumping forever pretty much. Uh, and when it destroys the fiat currency, it will, it will start uh, uh, devouring all the other assets that are really not uh, essential. <laughs> and um, and uh, that, uh, when someone understands that, uh, their their brain changes a little bit. Their, the way they think changes a little bit. And uh, if right now you wanted to, you know, uh, spend a uh, hundred bucks on, on a party uh, and uh, spend it on, on some beers, you will think, okay, well, these uh, hundred bucks and all these beers uh, may cost a thousand dollars a year from now, you know, or ten thousand dollars a couple of years from now. So, do I really want to do it? And a lot of people don't do it anymore, right? They stop doing what they were doing before. They change their habits. Literally, they change their habits. And um, if you, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, if you think about it a little bit deeper on a philosophical level, you can uh, come to conclusions like, uh, this is exactly how civilizations are, be uh, are built, right? People save, people think about the future. They don't live in the present, um, in the present, and I'm not talking about the present moment. I, I love living in the present moment, as in enjoying the present moment, but uh, not the type of present moment where you burn your life because, oh, whatever, it can end tomorrow, right? <laughs> no, you, you start thinking about the future and uh, you uh, invest in the future. You enjoy the present moment as is, and you don't uh, try to kind of, you know, um, just uh, go about life in the fashion that uh, just uh, doesn't doesn't really care about the future. So things like family, things like uh, legacy, things like uh, uh, building uh, to last, uh, things like culture, 
uh, all of that uh, all of that comes from uh, low time preference and it's been i think through history it's been shown uh, over and over again that uh, uh, as soon as people start living a high time preference life uh, that that means you know debauchery and uh, all kinds of stuff uh, uh, the their civilization collapses culture collapses and uh, unfortunately uh, this is what we are seeing right now in 2020 and uh, in probably next year we'll see a lot of that too and um, uh, we'll see we'll see where it goes i think bitcoin is the uh, light at the end of the tunnel that actually allows us to go back to low time preference and uh, the more people jump on the bandwagon uh, the better um, i don't think a lot of people will actually buy into the uh, building civilization uh, argument, they will probably just go for the number go up technology and just, you know, the simple, the simple, I want to get rich uh, argument, which is fine. That's, that's what the masses do. And uh, I'm completely fine with that. Yeah. Let, let's go bigger than the number grow up technology though. Sure. Um, and let's get into some of that uh, rebuilding civilization. And I think that's now, and I think the way you, you summarize that, uh, your quote, when the mind is liberated from the daily worry of impending financial ruin, it attains the capacity for clearer, nobler thinking. Unlimited potential previously locked away by fear of material suffering becomes available. Uh, and I, I think that explains um, generation or kind of generation Bitcoin and, and what it's about and where we are. And you know, I, I think we are going into these kind of two economies and, and another one you kind of, another tweet you had that I, I really kind of, um, I think sums it up well is, is world perception is subjective. Indeed, 8 billion people live in 8 billion different realities, but the truth is absolutely objective. It is one and final, there cannot be two. Your job is to dismantle as much of the subjective, subjectivity as you can and embrace objective reality. And, and I think some of uh, your work is really kind of get, trying to get at reality and truth. And, and you kind of go at the one, the age old problem of, uh, you know, how do you scam the planet? Uh, <laughs> how would you go about it? If you wanted to be a scammer and you wanted to scam at a level that, that you know, just normal people wouldn't comprehend, uh, you know, what would be the keys to um, scamming, scamming the planet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I guess when you look at my work, you would see some uh, uh, esoteric parts in it. Obviously, you know, there's uh, it's not just uh, you know uh, a simple mm. uh, digestion of uh, economics and philosophy and stuff like that. There's a little bit of that uh, too. Uh, I'm not talking about some uh, new age stuff. I, I think I like to go deeper, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, everything comes from somewhere. Um, but um, what uh, what I think is that uh, there's uh, there's two types of uh, uh, two types of uh, human uh, of the human uh, of the human comp uh, composition, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, there's seven, but let's let's uh, focus on the two that are the the the, the black and white of our world, right? Uh, the materiality and the spirituality, mm. the spiritual uh, life uh, and the material life. The spiritual life is the one that's you within you and the Material life is the one that's without. Uh, it's also it also has to do uh, with your body and with your bodily senses, right? You can touch things, you can see things, you can smell things. Mm. So, uh, what uh, you know, uh, when you go into all kinds of um, uh, religious texts and uh, sacred texts and spiritual texts, even modern ones, it doesn't really matter. They all kind of talk about the same thing that you know the. The, the human being is a spiritual being whose uh, uh, spiritual mm. part is kind of asleep, right? And whose material part is more awake right now. And, and uh, you're, you're essentially immersed in this material world and you are a little bit blind to uh, what you really are. So uh, when, uh, when we talk about the masses, when it, we talk about the, uh, uh, the population of the planet, the vast majority of people, they are in that uh, state of uh, catatonic sleep, right? They are in that state of uh, material, um, uh, material sleep, and uh, they only operate through the senses, the, the through the body, right? Their so-called third eye, the spiritual vision, is is a little bit closed. It's dim, right? Uh, and when you operate on uh, material 
uh, only on this uh, material plane. Uh, you are, uh, I'm not really afraid of that word, but you are not a lot better than a, just a regular animal, right? Mm. And that's how, that's how animals operate. And, uh, you know, the famous uh, uh, Pavlov uh, experiment with the dog and the bell when, you know, um, uh, Pavlov uh, trained the dog to salivate upon the uh, ringing the bell uh, is uh, applicable to humans. Uh, there have been many experiments in psychology. There have been uh, this. Uh, I don't remember who produced the video, but there was a video about, you know, uh, 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 a Christmas, uh, a Christmas present. Uh, someone uh, brought a lady into a supermarket and said, "Okay, um, we are going to uh, pick a present, whatever, for your child, right? And uh, we're going to predict exactly what you're going to pick." And you know, she she ended up uh, uh, picking up some kind of a toy. She even named the toy a certain name, and then um, they told her. Uh, that uh, they wrote it down or something and uh, she was really surprised how 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 they knew beforehand how what toy she would pick and uh, how she would name the toy right and they told and they walked her through the store and they showed her all the subliminal messages sprayed around the store like you know the same toy the advertisements of the toy even the advertisements of the name of the toy uh, all kinds of things that affect her uh, sen uh, sensual perceptions, like, you know, the eyes, uh, the touch, because they, uh, uh, they told her to touch some things, they told her to smell some things even, right? And uh, essentially, she was like a dog who was made to salivate uh, with a bell, right? Uh, does, that, does that make her an animal? Pretty much, right? So she was just uh, she was just trained to do a certain thing and she did it. So I think that a lot of people actually go through life in this, in a certain manner, in, in the similar manner that like mm -hmm. animals. Uh, and there are people out there, you know, not just psychologists, but other people out there who are aware of this and, you know, marketing people are just one part of those people, but there are, there are many other people who are aware of this and they, uh, they uh, use this against, you know, others, right? They use this against others. Like uh, Jordan Belfort is a great example, right? With his subliminal messaging, with his uh, neuro-linguistic programming and just the way he talks. It's, th it's all the same thing. It's just affecting someone's uh, perception, someone's minds uh, with, the, you know, with different techniques. Um, actually, in the, in the past, it was pretty much called black magic. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, there are people who are uh, who who are aware of this, and these are the people who are able to scam the planet, right? They are able to. If you are able to um, manipulate uh, uh, the masses through uh, all kinds of uh, 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 material perceptions, then uh, uh, then uh, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, this is how the um, this is how a lot of people are getting scammed into all kinds of things, and you know this is how consumerism was born because it's all advertisement, it's all uh, sensual uh, material stuff, right? It's all based on that stuff. Um, you can see subliminal messages absolutely anywhere you go uh, on TV, on you know on streaming services. You can see uh, advertisements. You can see infomercials. Uh, you can see. Um, uh, audio programming everywhere and a lot of people don't understand it they just listen to it and they just enjoy it as a regular program but it's not it's supposed to make them do certain things and of course right now they are developing they are getting better and better at it you know with google search optimization so it is so called uh, with uh, uh uh, search recommendations, video recommendations, and all kinds of things. Because now uh, we all have a tracking device in our pocket that uh, knows exactly what we do, who we talk to, how we talk, what we like, what we don't like. You know, you can talk about uh, uh, buying a dog and uh, five minutes later you get an advertisement for dogs and pet stores and things like that, right? So all of this uh, has, uh, has, a, a, uh, uh, has a root uh, in it right it's it comes from somewhere it's not uh, uh it's not for it's not a coincidence uh, so um you scam a planet by uh by taking advantage of uh humans uh, physical material um uh passions that's how you do it you you know and uh, I, I wrote articles about it uh, you know I, I wrote more about the, you know how you uh, scam people into believing that you know uh 
their money is uh, is good. Uh, that their you know uh, the political system is good, such as democracy and things like that. But uh, I think the, it all boils down to spirituality versus materialism, and we are now really really lacking in spirituality. But I also think that uh, we are at a turning point and. Actually, Bitcoin may help with that because by lowering time preference, you will have more time to think about not just the future, but also about uh, your own, uh, you know, your own self or where you are, your own inner world. And you can uh, have more time and more effort, uh, to, you know, to just uh, plunge into yourself and think about uh, developing that uh, that world, which is a lot bigger than the material world, I think. Sure. If you wanted to steer large populations of people would you know you be able to use you know something like democracy to do so? Yeah, uh, no, not really. I don't. I don't think so because um, uh, democracy, <clears throat> democracy has a lot of uh, a lot of issues in it. I think uh, what uh, I understand under democracy is more uh, uh, more in terms of uh, what Plato understood under it, right? And it's more like a republic rather than democracy. Mm. Um, and uh, I. Um, uh, I'm. I used to describe myself as an anarchist, and you know, uh, anarchy is more of a negative, uh, negatively viewed uh, terms right now. Uh, but uh, it's not really that. It's uh, uh, anarchy. I think uh, is more about economics rather than uh, you know uh, going and going out and blowing up things. <laughs> um, those are definitely anarchists in the bad light. Um, what what I think is that. Uh, uh, everything in the social sphere is uh, predicated upon one and single important uh, right, human right, and that is the right to private property. So besides that, no, re no right really matters because uh, the right to uh, private property pretty much uh, defines all the other rights that you have out there. And it's very easy to uh, illustrate it, for example, with the right to you know, uh, freedom of speech. But what is freedom of speech, right? Uh, when you come to my house, I can actually tell you what you can and cannot speak about because that's my house. You are on my property. So where exactly can you have uh, freedom of speech? Well, the only uh, absolute freedom of speech I'm talking about, right? Uh, you can only have absolute freedom of speech in a so-called public place, a place that apparently does not belong to anyone, right? It's, uh, it's basically, you know, your, uh, your park, it's the street, it's the... Uh, is the bench uh, somewhere, something somewhere on the beach? That's where you have uh, the right to uh, absolute free speech. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the right to free speech stems from uh, the right to private property because uh, it is uh, the uh, owner of the private property who decides what you can and cannot do there, right? Um, and then we basically uh, go, you know, go through these uh, through this uh, mental uh, exercises of uh, private property and uh, arrive at, uh, uh, at, uh, at a position where uh, in which we believe that uh, private property is, the, uh, is uh, a lot better than public property simply because private property owners, uh, they, they um, care about their property a lot more than, uh, than someone, than, than and nobody, right? Than uh, some uh, mythical uh, entity called government, right? Because when you say, this is government property. What does it mean? Who is the government, right? There is no particular person you can point to. Is that the president? Well, no, president is just a representative of the government. He's just the face of the government. Well, then is that the Congress? Is that, uh, you know, another uh, or Duma like in Russia? No, uh, the, any government consists of a particular set of people, right? So, uh, and, uh, Essentially, that's, uh, that, that boils down to this uh, a problem called the, the tragedy, of, uh, the tragedy of, uh, of the commons, right? Where uh, if a place is not uh, really owned by anybody, it's not going to be taken care of properly. And that's how we see lots of, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, lots of, lots of uh, uh, bad stuff happening with, uh, with the nature as well, with just uh, uh, violations of property and things like that. Um, uh, like the, you know, like an example with the, with a river, you go, uh, you have, uh, you know, a, a few villages that enjoy a river and uh, they decided not to claim any part of the river. So because the river doesn't belong to anybody, they just decide to 
uh, each each uh, village will decide to deplete the river as much as possible to stock up on the fish, right? Uh, and suddenly the river becomes uh, depleted. Uh, but uh, if um, each uh, uh, village uh, claims a part of the river, then they will take care to not deplete that part of the river. They want fish there. They want it all the time. They don't want to just you know go fishing once and then take all the fish so they will start taking care of things like you know uh, reproducing fish and conserving fish and uh, doing things like that uh so that that's what i'm talking about so uh all of this uh, brings us to um to uh things like republics and monarchies because mm -hmm. in those cases the people who uh, are essentially the ruling elite the ruling caste so to speak they are actually the owners of the land that they rule. Um, because uh, if you go to the United States, uh, who owns the United States? Well, no one owns the United States. It's, uh, you know, it's the people's property. Okay, if it belongs to the people. Can I go to this park? No, you can't go there after 10 p.m. Why? It belongs to me. You just said it. Well, no, it really, it's actually public land. It belongs to the government. Okay, who is the government? Well, it's all those people. Okay, so can they go there? <laughs> you know, things like that. You, it's really, really complicated because uh, there's absolutely, and I think it's it's made that way on purpose. But uh, if I'm a king and I own a piece of land, uh, uh, there's a clear owner of the land, right? Uh, so, and as a king, for example, or you know, I can be a, also a republic, right? So let's say I'm not a king. I have a council. There's just a council of 10, 10, 10 people who are hopefully you know the best of the best in their particular community you know one is the, the best artisan the other one is the best economist the other one is the best you know uh, arms dealer <laughs> whoever they are yeah they own the land and then uh they can create uh, clear rules and uh, because you uh own the land you also uh suddenly have a lower time preference because you want your land to produce uh, goods and services for you. You want to tend to your land because you're not a president who just comes for four years and then leaves in four years and doesn't care about your land. You stay there forever. And not only forever, you, when you die, the land becomes your children's land and then they have to tend to it. So uh, because you think about the future of your land, you want to give your children more than what you had when you, you know, uh, inherited the land. So you have to really think about things like, uh, do I really want to piss off my population with higher taxes? Do I really want to start unnecessary wars? Do I really want to uh, vaccinate them with stuff that <laughs> they don't really need, right? Things like that. Because, um, in you know, if, even if you look back in the uh, Middle Ages, for example, uh, there were no, there was no thing such as uh, uh, passports. There was no uh, such thing as, uh, you know, uh, uh, nationality. The borders were not really closed. If you didn't like your city, you didn't like Florence, you could go to Rome, and that's it. That was the end of it, right? But uh, uh, I, I, as uh, you know, uh, the member of the republic or the member of the, uh, you know, as a king, for example, me member of the royal family. Uh, I could not hold you within the walls of my city. Um, you were free to go. So what I had to do is to think about ways of actually attracting people, not to you know uh, th uh, uh, think of uh, how to uh, burden them more and more. And you attract them by creating better uh, conditions in your own land. So uh, when you talk about republics and kingdoms, you essentially talk about pieces of private property, kind of like, malls or restaurants or anything there that create uh, conditions for people that attract those people that create uh, conditions for them because they treat them like clients rather than uh, uh, slaves and even if you know mentally maybe they think of people like cattle they still want to tend to their cattle they still want to take care of their cattle you know some of the some of the best uh, cattle some of the best meat comes from these uh, um uh, uh, agricultural, uh, less agricultural, but more, you know, homestead type of uh, 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 ways of uh, raising cattle, right? Like uh, where, where people, where shepherds really, really take care of them. It's not like the uh, mass produced factory where everything is just a number. They actually love their, uh, they love their cattle and their cattle grows up really happy and then uh, they get really good meat. <laughs> so you kind of think about it the same way. Uh, if you're a shepherd, if you're a king, you have to think about your 
uh, people as a shepherd who, who, you know, and you tend to them. Uh, if before I thought about the word sheeple, <laughs> uh, sheep and people in, in a negative way, then now the way I think about it is more of a, you know, natural order thing. It's like, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's natural that uh, the planet is huge. There's 8 billion, of, uh, 8 billion people out there and clearly the vast majority of people are followers and only very few people are leaders, right? So uh, if we talk about natural order, the, you know, the laws of, the na of nature and how things are, uh, clearly most people are sheepish and other people are more like shepherds. Um, so again, uh, it's not the, it's not to, uh, you know, uh, put someone down and denigrate them or anything like that. It's just uh, a way to describe how things are. Uh, and uh, in, unfortunately, these days, uh, people don't like hearing truth because truth hurts a lot of the time, right? And uh, today in 2020, hurt feelings are a crime. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, uh, we will bring, bring that back. I think that needs to be uh, brought back the natural order of things needs to be brought back and uh, the forced uh, uh, so-called forced uh, um, uh, equality of outcome has to go because it has no place in natural order you cannot really manage 800 8 billion people uh, you cannot micromanage their lives so, uh, people have to have freedom of choice and if i am a king and there's another king uh, out there, you know, I'll do all my best to uh, create the best conditions for the people that uh, live uh, on my land. And if I don't, they have a f right to secede from me to go to another guy you know, or create their own kingdom if they find a piece of land. Yeah, um, you answered all my questions about that whole like first third of, of the conversation. And it was, it was great. And what I love about it too, is you kind of got into the chaos and order and how you find order through chaos and the world does too. And, and so that, that you know, we, we get through kind of like how the world can look at through, we've talked about democracy and monarchy and anarchy. And, and sort of now we get into like hierarchy, uh, sort of like order systems. Um, but let's turn to the heartbeat of your work um, because we are dealing with all of that. And, and like, you know, let's talk to, let's, let's get to like citadels and citadelium because I think this is the foundation of, of or your thesis of, of, of a lot of your work right now. And, and so what is like an inner citadel and how does one create or build one? Yeah, well, uh, when I talk about citadels, it's pretty much what I talked about in terms of republics or monarchies. We just want to bring them back, right? But uh, at the same time, uh, going back to our conversation between the material and the spiritual part of the human being, mm. uh, the inner citadel has to do with the spiritual part of the human being. So that uh, if I had to describe it in just one sentence, I would probably just quote our Jordan Peterson, who said, clean your room. And that's pretty much what it is. Uh, you really cannot go out and uh, venture uh, into rebuilding the world. You cannot uh, uh, go out into the world and say, okay, I want to change the world before you have taken all the necessary steps and uh, all the necessary trouble rebuilding yourself, reshaping yourself, because that's very, very important. If you think about the leader, uh, uh, you know, the, the, type, the, the leader phenotype, I guess, uh, the leader is uh, uh, someone who has all the best qualities that he wants to see in other people. So how does one, like, like before in the Middle Ages as well, right? The king who wanted to start a war, he actually went to war. He was the first one in the, you know, riding the horse and going into battle because otherwise who would want to fight for him if he didn't set an example, right? So that, that happened a lot of the time. So you have to set an example by building, by being um, that yourself. Uh, as as a pretty known uh, saying goes, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, so uh, clean your room, uh, get your mind, uh, mind, get your body in shape, get your, you know, finances. I actually talked about some um, uh, uh, spheres of uh, sovereignty that you have to really nail in your life. Uh, there are many different ways, but, and like I said, uh, this process is going to be um, 
endless. You will probably keep doing that until you die. But it's the effort and the intention that matters, uh, not really the end result, because you'll never be perfect. Perfection is God, essentially, so it's unattainable, right? But you can always uh, uh, go up little by little and uh, achieve higher levels. So this is what I'm talking about when, when I say build your inner citadel. If you think about it, uh, if you want to imagine uh you know uh, your own way of life if you want to imagine the you know the the the, what you are building inside of you you can just imagine it as a as a building or as a a citadel or as a city right okay uh, this is the my citadel and here i have my uh you know department where i work on my thought here i have a department where i work on my emotion here i work uh, on, on on my anger for example or here I, uh, you know, integrate my shadow personality, as uh, Carl Jung said, um, and uh, urged people to do. So uh, you do all that work before you venture out. Um, You know, do you really have to finish that work before you start doing something out in the material world? Of course not. Yeah. I'm very far from perfect. I haven't, I, I think I really have only scratched the surface with this type of work. Uh, but I'm already starting to do something outside, you know, in, in the material world. But the way I think about it is that what I do in the material world is only proportional to the level of development of my inner world. So, um, you know, going back to the billionaire example, uh, you have to be ready to be a billionaire internally. You have to be essentially a billionaire internally in mm-hmm. your spirit right. world to be a billionaire outside, right? If you are re- already a billionaire, you know, uh, and a billion is just a number, right? If you can just uh, say, you know, uh, like uh, from you know, PlayStation, you have levels for, uh, in some kind of game from one mm-hmm. to 10. If you say, and in a billionaire means level 10, for example, if you say inside you are level 10 already, then you are ready to be a billionaire outside, right? So it, it all corresponds, the principle of correspondence, so to speak. And, um, so that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, uh, build the uh, build your own personality, build your spirit first, uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, go out there and uh, give a, a show show the example to everybody else. Uh, start building something, uh, build a following. If you are uh, a leader, if you're not a leader, then you, you don't have to be. You can do your things uh, just on the way, uh, just the way you are on the level where you are mm-hmm. uh, very comfortable. Yeah, I, I love that about the, the inner citadel. I, I think that's a, even a, for me, a pre-Bitcoin thing. It's kind of always working on your inner self. But let's turn a little bit to the physical world. You know, you're, you're building out this inner citadel and you want maybe your, your physical citadel and you want to build it, whatever that means to you, you know, your homestead or join a community. And, and you ask an interesting question, you know, are you going to run forever? And uh, I pondered that in a lot of different ways. And I tried to answer that for myself, even without reading the piece. And, you know, the other one you, you ask is, you know, build your citadel where you are or find a new better place. And I really struggle with these questions. And I'm curious your thoughts. You know, you've lived in a lot of different places. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask where you are now, but I, I, I've read that, you know, you grew up in Russia or, or uh, I believe one of the, the republics maybe. And then uh, you lived in Canada for a bit. Um, so what do you think, uh, do you, wherever you are, and you don't have to say, but like, are you where you are forever? Are you, are, are you going to look for a new place? Where, and what, and frame that maybe how one would ask that of themselves. Yeah. Uh, I think what's important here is that you actually settle down eventually. Uh, you know, this uh, concept of uh, digital nomadism mm-hmm. is, uh, really, uh, taking off these days, but, uh, Uh, I think it's only suitable for young people who really have no family, who are just, you know, out there working as programmers or, you know, web designers and things like that. Sure, go ahead and uh, travel the world and explore and things like that. But when you start uh, uh, settling down mentally, uh, meaning, you know, you, you, okay, uh, I want to have one woman. I want to have children with her. I want to, you know, um, I want to just continue uh, this uh, life this way. Uh, then you you actually have to settle down physically too because uh, like I say the the physical manifestation of the world is just uh, the physical world is just a manifestation of your inner world of, of your uh, spiritual mm-hmm. world right so settling on, uh, starting a family is basically a sign of you settling down 
in your mind, right? Because uh, you you don't jump from one relationship to another. You're you're settling down. So exactly the same process will have to uh, repeat in the uh, material world, and you will have to settle down too. I think that's very important because uh, uh, it's you know I have tried it, and it's really tiring to actually travel, although. It can be very exciting because you see a lot of many places, but um, at the same time, there has to be this uh, uh, type of um, feeling that uh, you belong somewhere. Because if you are a digital nomad, you don't belong anywhere. And at first, I thought it was cool uh, because you know I'm just an international citizen and mm -hmm. you know all that uh, jazz. But uh, at the end of the day, you still have to belong somewhere, uh, even if it's. If it's not you, the place where you were born, you can still find a place where you share values with people who live there, or you can start a new place. And uh, that's probably where the uh, idea for citadels comes. Uh, because uh, if you can't find a place, you can find at least a community of like-minded uh, individuals who will start a place like that with you in the future. Uh, and you can start it online first. Um, so yeah, I, I have traveled uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, I am in Russia right now. Uh, will I stay here forever? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't say that because uh, uh, things change, right? Uh, I can't really predict the future. Uh, if, uh, you know, for some reason, the situation becomes unbearable here for me or for my family, uh, uh, then uh, I think uh, I will be forced to go somewhere else and gladly, you know, I'm not really limited to this uh, single place and traveling the world and living in uh, uh, another country actually gave me the opportunity and uh, the necessary paperwork to actually have a choice, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a saying in Russia, where you are born is where you are useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, and it, uh, now it kind of rings the bell because uh, okay, I'm here and I'm uh, I'm looking at things uh, from a completely different perspective. Sounds like propaganda way... to me. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is. From uh... from some of the philosophy I've heard about, and I'm no expert on Russian philosophy, and I want to get into some things going on with Russia. Sure. Um, but one thing I've heard the notion that like the the Russian uh, entity being the government, whatever it is, and I didn't mean the entity being the entity or the government or whatever the the the, the mind uh, hive of, of Russia is. I've heard that the notion of power is that the citizens serve are, are kind of like the cells of the body, and so mm -hmm. you know you cut the toe off if that's going to serve the body. We don't care about whatever we, you serve the body, versus more of like you are your own being and you're part of a thing. Uh, that's that's separate from you um, and yeah. that's why it's felt very propaganda to me because it's very useful like you stay here and serve us um, but I, I get it too and I really struggle well one thing I don't struggle with is you know I, I, I'm a family man and that is my part that is part of my inner citadel and and I struggle with the physical part in terms of like we will always be together wherever we go but I, you know I'm kind of I've been a bit of a transient person. I've, when I was younger and not, you know, uh, you know, in my family yet, I, I did travel and live in different cities and enjoy being an international citizen and getting to see different places and kind of broadening my horizons and getting away from where I grew up. Um, but I really struggle with, you know, like may, maybe we'll move every three years as long as we're all together, you know, because I want to go where it's best for me and for us for my family. And, and, you know, you wrote a piece called The World of a Thousand Kingdoms. And there's a lot to ponder there. And I, I do see this kind of like future world of citadels. My house is already a citadel. You know, the government might take it from me, but then we'll find another citadel. Um, but in my mind, this is our citadel. And, you know, I wonder like though, and I'm not, emo I'm trying not to be emotionally attached to you know, the United States of America as a national <laughs> thing. But, you know, what do you think that uh, the, the, the 50 states will stay together? And, and does that even matter? And would it be better if, if it was broken up in some way? Maybe that just means as a federal government light, um, but you got 50 independent kind of states and nations. And, and again, I'm not trying to get into like borders and states. I don't care about that stuff. Just are, are things gonna fracture? Maybe that's a positive thing, but what do you think? And, and what does that mean for the American project? Yeah, um, well, I think there's, a, there's, I think it can fracture, but uh, there's also, uh, two components to that. The first one uh, can be negative and the, the second one can be positive. 
The negative one is uh, we all know that uh, you know there's a bunch of uh, individuals in the world uh, you know, going under the label of globalists, I guess, who would love the states, uh, the nation states to crumble because they want to unite the whole planet under one super state, right? Uh, which pretty much already exists, uh, you know, under the brand of the United Nations and, uh, uh, and that kind of, and all its uh, auxiliary institutions, including the World Bank and things like that. But they want to, you know, further that process. I, I mean, it's cl uh, clearly laid out out in the uh, Great Reset book by uh, Klaus Schwab uh, and uh, all those uh, uh, Great Reset and Build Back Better uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, outlets. But uh, the second, uh, and, and that I see uh, negative as a negative because that, um, that includes the destruction of uh, culture. That just includes the destruction of culture, the Belong the part where you actually belong and have a feeling of belonging, right? Because that's created by culture and tradition. Uh, that's created by your, you know, even uh, things like ethnicity and language. That's that's how you uh, have the feeling of belonging, right? You have a bunch of individuals who do exactly the same things as you do year after year, uh, generation after generation. That's that's what it is. Uh, so they want to destroy that, and they just want to create a completely uh, monotonous, uh, 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 family-free, uh, culture-free uh, society where everybody's just a cell in a body, just exactly the, the way you described it, right? Uh, but then there is the other side of the same coin, uh, which also concerns the destruction of the same nation states uh, down the road, but uh, has to do something has something to do with what we are dealing with in terms of citadels and Bitcoin and the world under uh, anarcho-capitalism, right? Uh, which uh, is essentially the breaking down of uh, huge and unsustainable nation states into more sustainable, more manageable, uh, uh, you know, provinces or even city states, uh, which which is what citadels are, because. The, if you read the books by Nassim Taleb, he talks about uh, extreme localism and how uh, the how the uh, the scale of a city is probably the largest scale that is manageable by a bunch of people. Anything beyond that is already unmanageable because uh, if you imagine a city, uh, you know where your rulers are. If you're a king in Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein is a tiny kingdom. It's literally no bigger than my town where I live, right? And you can you can go and drive to the king literally 10 minutes and you're there. Uh, you know where they get together. Uh, he does a crazy stuff, you kill him. That's, that's what happens uh, to the bad king. But uh, in Russia or in the United States, uh, the president is, th uh, is thousand miles uh, away from you. You don't even you haven't met him. You don't know him. Um, you ha you haven't even met the uh, governor of your uh, state. You haven't probably even met the mayor of your uh, city, right? So um, that that's what I mean. And in that case, uh, it would be positive. But at the same time, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We have to be careful about that because <laughs> uh, uh, if we if we are just uh, if we just go about it like, uh, hey, we want the the end of the state right now. Let's destroy it right now. Then you have to remember that the other side, the the globalists, they still exist. They are still there, waiting for, actually for it to happen to further their agenda, right? So. Uh, I'm just thinking what uh, would be a, a better way to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of coming to a conclusion right now that uh, uh, everything that we have right now in terms of uh, how the material you know, uh, uh, world is organized is what we actually deserve on a spiritual level, right? Uh, the Russians deserve to have what they have. The Americans deserve to have what they have and the Indians deserve to have what they, you deserve your rulers. You deserve the system that you have. Um, the system is only created by the people exactly like you, uh, by, but uh, you know, there's just a, a few of them who are a little bit more ambitious than you, right? And that's it. And it's created by the, by the people like you. So, you know, on a spiritual level, I guess there's a, uh, uh, 
there is the logos of a person, but there is also a logos of a community or a, a whole country. Like right? a whole country can be viewed as an entity, essentially comprising of individual logi uh, or the souls of of the individuals who live there, right? Who are similar on many levels, right? They are similar individuals on many levels in terms of how they think, uh, in terms of their collective unconscious, uh, you know, as per uh, Carl Jung. Uh, so obviously when you imagine a Russian, it, you imagine a particular, a particular picture in your mind, right? Because that's the picture that was created, not just by, you know, uh, anti-Russian propaganda, but just by the Russians themselves. That's how they are. Uh, exactly the same with Americans, right? So this is what I'm talking about in terms of the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the soul of a whole country, right? And uh, mm. I think that uh, right now, uh, what we have in the world is uh, exactly what people deserve. And it will take some time for people to develop, uh, to, to achieve a new level uh, in order to actually realize and kind of wake up from this uh, uh, sleep and understand, well, you know what, this huge... Uh, a piece of land called the United States of America is great, but you know, it's it's really really hard to manage uh, by a single entity called the Congress or the President. Uh, we would really love, you know, we the great state of Texas, for example, would really love to be our own entity, and I'm sure we'll be a lot more efficient if we are just separate, right? Uh, something like that. If People actually understand that and actually wake up to this uh, uh, knowing and not uh, and not uh, get uh, activated uh, by <laughs> by propaganda, right? Then I think it will uh, happen um, very very positively. It will be a good thing and it will uh, happen naturally. And then the state of Texas itself, when it succeeds, uh, it may break down into smaller parts. Like you know, Austin will become its own little republic or monarchy or whatever or you know principality or whatever it is uh and and so on and so on so i think it has to be a natural process rather than um you know rather than something that's done by force by people who just you know say okay rise up and uh, let's just kill all the uh, guys and secede you know um because uh, you you become what you fight and uh, you don't really um you don't really achieve any uh, higher spiritual levels when you actually take things by force. I think every little cell of that body has to wake up to this new opportunity to understand, uh, uh, to, to, to essentially uh, be enlightened in a certain way, right? So I guess what I'm talking about here is more of a human uh, and uh, human spiritual evolution rather than just uh, changing things by, by force, by, you know, by uh, telling people to just just do it by force and uh, you know without really understanding what you're doing yeah that's yeah uh it's never been sustainable that way you know i really feel what you're saying and uh, in terms of the u.s like let's think about it and, and i'll think about it in in two 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 kind of sides of the coin and maybe they are the same side and then and i'll leave that up to you so, you know, let's say that the U.S. kind of fails on its own accord due to its own success just in regards to size and, and, and the success of the central government to continue to centralize and then kind of brutalize their people and take from their people. Because, you know, I, I really feel that because in terms of, uh, and I'm not like, I never, I wasn't, I'm not anti-state from birth and, and it, you know, it wasn't raised by revolutionaries. Um, but, you know, I would like more decisions to be made closer to my home so that I'm closer to that power structure so I can have more impact. Uh, I feel very, I have very little impact on a national conversation and national policy. They don't even need my money anymore. So, you know, they don't listen to any of us uh, on any core issues and, and they keep provide, quote unquote providing and therefore taking more. So let, that's one camp, right? It's just gonna fail because of its own size and success. And then, you know, there's maybe more of like internal implosion. And, and maybe that's, and maybe it's not a different side of the coin, but you know, but I'll throw the word out like propaganda. And yeah. then I just really want to turn to Yuri Bezmenov. And you posted mm -hmm. the video in one of your articles. And I've seen that, I've watched that video several times. And, and I'm not going to say anything more than that. Just, I'm going to open it to you. What do you make of that video? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
I think that uh, that that video has uh, uh, has something to do with the proverbial parasites that I you know um, I describe in some of my work, uh, and uh, those are pretty much the globalists, and they 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 have used uh, the same tactics over and over uh, as I as I mentioned before in terms of you know uh, the animal nature of the human being. They know precisely how it works, and they use all those. Uh, uh, they use uh, 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 what they have learned over probably centuries <laughs> uh, on on the public. So they have an agenda. I think they you know they want to uh, they want to have a one world government, whatever you can call it, uh, and uh, they are working towards it by uh, destroying countries one by one. Right. Uh, this, the exactly the same thing happened in Russia in 1917 when they uh, just uh, uh, pretty much destroyed the Russian Empire and you know uh, killed the Tsar and his family. Uh, so exactly the same thing they want to do in the United States, but uh, uh, obviously not the same tactics work, and uh, you can't really wrap everything in the same uh, uh, language, right? You can't really uh, you you have to kind of go go around it. And uh, there's also a Chinese video about. Uh, uh, about how the Chinese work and how their uh, strategies work in terms of uh, uh, destabilizing foreign governments, right? And they basically say that you have to really, really understand how the local population thinks, how they work, what their cultures and tra cultural traditions are, how their government works, and then you have to turn their own system against them, right? So. That's exactly, and, and, and Yuri Bezmenov talks, talked about uh, similar things, right? Uh, but he talks more about uh, the, um, he talks more about the actual implementation of the uh, agenda, right? And he says, okay, step one, you do this, step one, you do that. Uh, but the Chinese, they talked more about the, uh, the meta level of the, of the, of the issue, right? They, they said, okay, uh, let's let's take the example of the United States. The, in the United States, there has always been this problem of you know racism, for example. So this is a great problem to uh, take advantage of. We have to take it and uh, turn it against them. We have to stir it up completely so it becomes uh, absolutely chaotic, right? And this is where it all comes from, uh, all the BLM and stuff like that. And I'm not even American. I'm a Russian living in Russia, but uh, you know, I just kind of watch these things happen uh, from where I am. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it to me, it's uh, kind of clear. Uh, I may be wrong as well because uh, you know, again, I'm not American. I, I don't know uh, everything 100%. But uh, I also watch it with curiosity because. I understand that America is pretty much the most significant player on the whole uh, world arena and whatever happens there uh, ripples through the world, right? It, it will affect Russia, it will affect uh, every other country in the world, especially now that uh, uh, Russia's uh, uh, ruble is essentially backed by the United States dollar, right? <laughs> uh, like it, it has to have an effect. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, what uh, Yuri Bezmenov described is just uh, part of that uh, agenda, and uh, I don't think uh, you know uh, he he was lying or anything. He he knows what he's talking about. Um, we see a lot of the stuff that's uh, that he described happen in in the United States very very clearly. And uh, who are the you know string pullers? Who who is doing all that? That's probably for all of us to find out, and I think we will eventually find out. Uh, even though I talk about the parasites, I, you know, I can't really name them. I can't put a name and a face to them, right? You know, uh, you can go to the usual suspects and, you know, say, okay, it can be like the, the Rothschilds or Rockefellers, but uh, uh, everybody knows about them and uh, no one really does anything about them. But maybe they are not even the, the ones who are doing this. They are part of them. Uh, but are they, they at the highest level really or not? <laughs> so I, I don't really know, right? It's uh, for all of us to find out. Um, I am very sure that someone has this information. <laughs> uh, at some point it will be released. Somehow we are living in an information age. Um, I don't think they will be able to stop the leaks forever. You know, things, people talk, people talk. And, uh, and now we have Bitcoin, another good part of Bitcoin, right? Uh, uh, you you know you place a bounty of one bitcoin on some information 
Today it's only $27,000, but uh, tomorrow can be $270,000 or in a few years, $2.7 million. Someone will talk and there will be a lot of rich Bitcoiners able to pay for that information, right? So uh, I think that's how Bitcoin uh, uh, makes the world a little better uh, at the same time, right? Uh, yeah. People, uh, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners that I know, they are really really good people. They have, uh, you know, low time preference. They think about the future. They care about family stuff. They, they really want to just uh, see, they, they want to make sure that the world is better for their children and their uh, grandchildren. Right. And uh, a lot of them will be very, very rich within several years. So what do you think they're going to do when they have all that money and power? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there will be a huge counterbalance to, uh, to, to, people who who do things uh, that uh, Yuri Bezmenov talked about. You know, when I watched the Yuri thing, I really, Yuri Bezmenov thing, um, I really, I couldn't put my finger on what, I feel like he was telling the truth. But in the back of my mind, I also didn't know if he was seeding propaganda himself. And because w- what I come up against there is, you know, it didn't seem like things played out at home with Russia as planned. And if they could export and, you know, kind of, destabilize nations abroad, you would think they'd be able to stabilize home within whatever manner they want. But maybe, maybe things went at home exactly the way they wanted it to. You know, maybe uh, that that's the other side of the coin I don't know. And, and I can't help but link him to like people like Snowden and Assange, who for me are really, you know, halls of mirror, uh, you know, uh, hall of mirrors. And I'm still trying to wrap my head about both those cases and they're separate. But like Snowden, it's very interesting just, you know, I mean, to take your own life in your hand. We all talk about sovereignty and independence, but now he's running from the world's strongest nation. Mm -hmm. And he has to go to another nation to seek comfort. And that's, you know, an enemy of his enemy now. And he's entrusted his life in theirs, basically. You know, the same way Yuri Bezmenov, I think, had to entrust his life with Canada and probably the U.S., and you would think if they're revealing such secrets that, you know, these other entities would be able to find and, and deal with them. And I just, I'm really having a hard time getting around these, these cases and uh, the, the amount of, let's call it responsibility or just chutzpah that they, they take on to fight these battles, which on some levels obviously are about freedom of information. Um, so, yeah, I... I um, what do you think now with the dynamic between, you know, China, Russia, and the U.S.? Is, is Russia really a player in this trifecta, or are they really kind of more a little bit of a pawn between the two nations and, and kind, of, kind of like trying to play the role of a bishop? Because um, they don't have yeah. a very big economy. Um, they have a lot of resources, but those resources are becoming more abundant or less needed or, or however you want to argue them going forward. I mean, it's still yeah. geopolitically... Uh, strategic, but w- where do they fit in the puzzle? Uh, I think uh, I think Russia geopolitically, Russia is important uh, uh, mainly because it has enough nukes to you know wipe out a whole planet, <laughs> just like uh, the United States mm. <laughs> does, right? So uh, even China doesn't have this much, right? So uh, Russia is important in terms of its uh, military power and that may be the infantry. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the high-end stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the relationship between the United States and China, uh, I'm not really sure. All I know is that, uh, yes, Russia is uh, causing up with China simply because it's seen uh, so much pushback from the West, right? From uh, from Europe, from the United States, like just read the news. Uh, there's always uh, sanctions, 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 sanctions. So they really, they cut off the business uh, from Russia all the time. They, you know, uh, put uh, all kinds of obstacles in Russians way. For example, Russia wants to export their, export their gas uh, to, to Europe. They just, they haven't been able to build that the pipeline for years and years because of many different things, right? So, uh, so yeah, so it's, it's no wonder, you have to understand that the Russia probably just really cares about Russia, right? <laughs> and whoever uh, provides better, you know, a better environment for Russia's development kind of uh, gets uh, Russia's friendship. And that, that's what I think. So if you, uh, 
uh, openly confront and kind of you know put sticks in the in the wheels uh, all the time, then uh, it does not create really good relationship. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not I'm not here to defend the Russian government. Uh, uh, I'm just saying that uh, um, I think the United States is supposed to do what's best for the United States and Russia is supposed to do what's best for Russia. And sometimes those interests do not, uh, um, they do not match, right? They are sometimes uh, opposite. So uh, it's no wonder, I mean, we have almost 200 countries in the world and uh, uh, I think they are, uh, while some of them are friendly, you still have to think in terms of, uh, uh, in the capitalistic terms, they are still all, uh, uh, adversaries in a sense, right? Uh, they are not, uh, they, they can be friends, but they still compete with each other. And competition uh, requires, uh, uh, requires all kinds of uh, things to happen. So yeah, um, right now, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really impartial. Um, I'm not um, what you would call a, uh, you know, a, an avid patriot or anything like that. Um, I, um, I I chose the country because I th I think it has a, um, it has better environment for uh, things for low time preference things like uh, mm. family culture and uh, things like that you know it's a thousand year old culture and it's uh, uh, it's really family oriented that there is no uh, there's no uh, there's no such things that happen in Canada in the U S in terms of education and uh, you know the destruction of uh, morality and kind of family uh, values uh, so that uh, that really turned me off uh, when i started the family i didn't really care about that before uh, but now i do so yeah that that really matters and here they are trying to kind of uh, keep that keep it that way and uh, i don't know how you can trust how much you can trust putin and the government but uh, putin has uh, said it repeatedly that uh, russia wants to be a sovereign country, doesn't want to be affected by anybody's decision to go this or that way. Um, although, you know, their response to coronavirus uh, is uh, a bit disappointing, but uh, not so much either, because I mean, uh, right now I'm here and it's business as usual. Nothing is, uh, there's no lockdowns or anything like that. And the international travel restrictions are really not on the part of the uh, Russia is just on the part of other countries that, uh, you know, restricted their travel. So nothing is uh, shut down here. Everything is uh, proper. There's no curfews. There's no checkpoints. Absolutely nothing like that. Uh, yeah, some masks and stuff like that. But that's that's pretty much everywhere, I guess. They, they, they had to take to, to do something to, <laughs> to look like they're doing something, right? Um, yeah, so... Uh, as a matter of fact, I think Russia might take this as an opportunity and while the rest of the world shuts down and, you know, shuts down and uh, kills their small business, uh, they mm -hmm. will try to actually prop it up, right? Uh, so not, not too bad if you ask me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but like I said, uh, I don't have a very, very strong emotional attachment. If something happens uh, and I'm not able to stay here, I will, uh, uh, I will go. Yeah, I really want to visit uh, specifically St. Petersburg. I'd have to touch down in Moscow as well. And anywhere else maybe you recommend or that's worth going to. I really want to go. One of the things, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Russian Ark. Um, no, I haven't. It's by one of Russia's most famous filmmakers. I, uh, I don't remember his name, but it's a really beautiful and for me moving piece where um, it, it takes place in the, the museum in St. Petersburg. And they, they actually shut the museum down, I think, for one day. I think it was Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. The fil filmmakers got access. And um, the movie is a, like an 80-minute one-shot piece where they go through the museum. It's a, I think it's a Russian man, maybe from the 19th century, with a Frenchman from the 18th century who's visiting Russia in present day. And they go through each room in, in, in the museum, and each room represents a period of Russian history over the last 1,000 or 2,000 years. I don't remember the exact specifics, but each room then comes alive as they move through it um, to kind of show the history of Russia. And, and then there's a dialogue between the Russian and the Frenchman about art and what Russians view as art versus what, you know, maybe more Renaissance art and, and French and Spanish and Italian art. And it was just a really interesting piece. Um, one of the many reasons I'd love to visit Russia. Um, so I'd love to turn to, you know, um, 
the knowledge universe and and how you know one deals with kind of like and this is something i'm really been kind of pondering it's like how do you deal with all the information you know coming at you and how do you kind of frame up like how, like what is information and and i think you did a great job of it and so like how do you look at the knowledge universe and like what is a star and what is a constellation and a planet and how do you kind of link all these things together? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did that a while ago when I was thinking of um, how, how do I filter the information that comes at me from all sides. And, uh, you know, right now I've, uh, I think I've already matured enough to basically uh, figure out that uh, what you get uh, is usually you're bombarded with uh, bits and pieces of information from all sides, right? And then uh, at first, uh, especially in the first years of your life, in the first maybe couple of decades, you really have no idea what that is, what any of this is, because nothing really uh, makes sense. So there are almost no patterns. But then as you go through life and through experiences, uh, you start seeing patterns and you start connecting the dots. So it's a piece of information that you did not really pay attention to, but you remembered, uh, was not relevant before, but now it becomes relevant because mm -hmm. you connected it with another piece of information, right? Uh, and uh, when you get uh, uh, when you get these patterns uh, and you start connecting a pattern to another pattern, you start getting these constellations of uh, of information, and then. Uh, these pieces of information, like a puzzle, they uh, basically show you a picture, right? Uh, they show you uh, something mm. that, uh, that that's more unified and that's not uh, completely broken down into irrelevant pieces. They are now all together like a piece of puzzle. For example, uh, when you learn, for example, when you deliberately take a course um, and you want to learn about something, you know, like music, for example, um, you know that uh, whatever you're learning from a textbook, uh, you are learning about music. So you already know that all of this is, uh, uh, all of this is filed under the category music, right? So that's clear to you and you just know, okay, now I have to start with, uh, you know, the, uh, how the notes work and then this and then that, but I'm all learning about music. But there are th some things in life that you don't know that they, are, they fall under a certain category and only later you start putting them under a certain category. And that's how I started with, you know, things like spirituality, for example. Uh, I, I got uh, information from all uh, sources and they were pieces of information from, uh, uh, from business books, even from uh, psychology, from uh, history, from uh, 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 spiritual books and from all. And uh, I didn't really make any connection between them. But then I also figured out that, well, wait a minute, all these sources and all these authors talk about the same thing just in their own words. A business person just talks about the same thing, but in business terms, terminology. Mm -hmm. And then a spiritual guy about the same thing, but in, in spiritual way, right? And suddenly they all started connecting and then I got kind of a, a whole picture of or some kind of a concept, for example. Um, and uh, so uh, right now, basically the way I think about information is that uh, uh, it's, it's fine to be exposed to all kinds of information first, but eventually you will have, uh, uh, at some point you will have to pick a direction and go in a particular direction. And if right now you don't know which direction, that's completely fine because you simply haven't found it, right? But at some point you will see better picture or pictures in front of you and you will have to kind of go and dive deeper into these particular pictures. If I, you know, uh, if I didn't know I was actually exposed to some spiritual material before, but now because uh, all these patterns formed a topic of spirituality in front of me, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to study this topics of spirituality deliberately. And I'm going to pick the information that I'm exposed to instead of it being thrown at me from all kinds of sources, just randomly. Right. And uh, that's how I treat information right now. I try to not, uh, I try to not basically consume randomly and mindlessly. I try to deliberately choose the direction where I go. And uh, it's uh, shaping up really nicely. I like it. Uh, you know, I think uh, I still have a lot, a lot to learn, but, you know, maybe 10 years from now, I'll be very, very focused, like laser focused on some specific topics and specific directions. And that's when I probably can call myself an expert in some field, because right now I still feel like I'm a little bit here and there. <laughs> you know, I'm being thrown around 
uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting um, uh, experience uh, because you can see how th- how your your knowledge base uh, is forming uh, in front of you, right? Uh, but that requires you to be kind of awake in a certain sense because you have to evaluate, you have to see it, right? You have to walk through life in a more awakened state. Your your level of consciousness, self consciousness, has to be. Uh, at a little bit uh, higher level because uh, otherwise you just uh, go about life mindlessly you don't notice you act uh, you react to things instead of acting uh, consciously right so yeah that's that's my my approach to information right now I'm, I'm sure i'll learn a lot more in the future yeah um you know we we touched on bitcoin is a tool for succession the least and but but I think that we kind of like really got around a lot of the ideas, and I I, I do recommend people go and read that piece specifically, and in all your work, um, that for me is a very seminal piece. It's what um, actually what brought this this chat together. Um, and when I was prepping for Joe Rogers, uh, I came across his uh, curated Bitcoin uh, words, and uh, his September uh, I believe his his September issue. Uh, a collection of articles had that in it. That's how I came across you um, through kind of Joe Rogers kind of recommending the piece. And, and I love that piece. And I'm going to quote from it now. So you, you can only change the world by changing yourself. Bitcoin may be the catalyst you were looking for. Proclaim your independence, start a family, cultivate your community, succeed. So my, my final question to you is, you know, um, so I think we touched on a lot, not everything. Uh, and I do recommend people broaden their horizon by if they have not read your work or listened to the podcast already. But um, how does family and religion and God, and you could touch on those two uh, as appropriate or not at all, but how does family, religion, and God, you know, fit into rebuilding civilization? Um, and uh, you, you can basically view it on different levels, right? Um, uh, you start from the, you start from the, uh, from yourself, from your personal uh, uh, side of things, and then you grow into the uh, family, and then grow it in community, and then country. And uh, basically, you have to, as I mentioned before, you have to develop. Uh, basically, extrapolate. You you take this same principle and you develop it within your family, right? You have mm. to perfect all kinds of things. You can have to, you have to perfect. You uh, basically then take that and uh, expand it into your community, right? So when you talk about these levels, what is the highest level that you uh, what's after the kind of the planet? Well, then you talk about the whole cosmos essentially and the whole thing that there is, that's uh, what you have to, you have to work towards. And I think the, I, I think that uh, the rules of the game or the laws of nature are completely universal, right? They work both on the smallest level and they work on the highest level. Um, and there's probably no small and high level, like it's everything is infinite, right? <laughs> we can only just think about what I have to say is that uh, uh, there is this uh, principle called the principle of correspondence as above, so below, as they say, uh, used to say in ancient times. Um, your inner world, uh, is called the microcosm and the outer world is called macrocosm, right? Uh, and they are actually this world. The other one is just a reflection of what's inside of you mm-hmm. on a macro, on the physical level, right? Not really separate. They are all one. They are uh, connected to each other. And work on yourself when you work on yourself when you're in a world. I literally talk about the actually, okay. Um, is that better now or? Yeah, it's I'm definitely... just thinking because my battery was dying. Maybe. Ah. Okay. okay. Yeah, th- I think it is better. My battery was dying. Maybe it was time uh-huh. to to save to save the battery by uh, cutting low bandwidth or something. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, with... we we can uh, start where you stopped. Sure. Um, do you want to go back to that 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 last question, or do you want to kind of pick up a little bit into it, or do you want me to ask you a different question? Um, it's up to you. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go back to the last question and then I'll, I'll do my best with um, kind of the technical side of it. Um, and I, I just really sure. enjoyed this chat so far. Um, so, you know, my, my last question uh, and to kind of regain my train of thought was, you know, um, 
uh, your, your work talks about rebuilding civilization, a, a lot of it. And that's the one aspect that maybe we haven't talked about, like kind of in, in, in a little bit more depth. But the, 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 the thing I wanted to lace in there uh, specifically was family. And, and if you want to touch on God or religion at all and how it fits into rebuilding civilization, and, and if you don't want to touch on those two, but really family and, and what it means to rebuild civilization. Um, because I think we talked a lot about the tools of building a civilization for yourself. And I, I'll call that a citadel. Mm -hmm. And then we've talked about the tools of building that out a little bit more where you, you can kind of build that into a community and then into sort of like a, uh, sort of a small anarchist, minicus state, or uh, you know, a world of a thousand kingdoms, or even just live in America or Russia or China, but you know, or anywhere in the world. But you know, to rebuild civilization uh, with with family as the kernel of that, as I think that's a big part of uh, your work, and a little bit more of the later stages. So, what what does the family unit represent in the rebuilding of civilization? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, family unit is uh, essentially uh, a, a cell in our body, in the, in the body of our civilization, because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the most important parts of it. Because uh, if you think about it, uh, we, we're all uh, social beings. Uh, humans are social beings, and we cannot really exist uh, one by one individually. We always have to, ha uh, to form some kind of a collective. Um, and... Uh, uh, if you're if you're just uh, all by yourself, you are either you know you either live in a cave uh, because you're just a purposeful uh, ascetic, uh, or uh, you're you know uh, you're probably an outcast and uh, you were uh, uh, you were expelled from the community where you were in. So if we have to normally uh, create a community around ourselves, and the first uh, uh, building block of that community. Is usually a family because uh, you get together with someone and um, you build that uh, little uh, cell in a community that actually lasts until you die in 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 the best case scenario uh, so uh, that cell uh, lasts uh, until you die you have uh, you have a spouse but also you have uh, something to live for uh, with the spouse, uh, spouse, which is your kids, and someone to uh, give your legacy to who can continue the work that you do. Um, so when you take these uh, little cells, these families, and uh, uh, unite them in a community, because uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this family and this family and this family, they share the same language, they can share the same uh, religion, they can share the same uh, understanding of, uh, you know, uh, how things work in terms of you know uh, uh, how to how to do the land, how to do uh, this, uh, whether to go to war, not to go to war, all kinds of things that basically form the culture of that community. Um, then uh, that's uh, that's what's that's why I consider family as the most important part of uh, any society. So when you go uh, when you level up, you know, in terms of uh, uh, a city or a country and uh, uh, even the whole planet, uh, uh, it's all great, but uh, at the same time, you have to understand that uh, those higher levels are only possible because the family is there. Uh, and we talked about how, you know, the globalists, for example, they want to get rid of the family and they want to create uh, uh, atomic individualism, right? Mm -hmm. a uh, atomic individuals. Uh, I don't think that's possible because... Uh, uh, it is the uh, natural necessity for a human being to form a familial relationship throughout life. So the only thing, the only way they can actually achieve that is by killing that desire in a human being, by killing that desire for socializing, by killing the desire of creating a lifelong bond with someone. Wow. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the, we can we could of course go into all kinds of conspiracies here but the way they want to do it is through material things like uh medication and you know the ab abolition of uh religion and through uh lifelong indoctrination through schools and universities and all kinds of things and just a regular propaganda on tv obviously uh but um, uh that's the only way they can do it because otherwise it is a natural human uh emotions natural human 
uh, inclination to create uh, a life-lasting uh, bond. And you normally create it by uh, uh, having a bond with uh, the opposite sex, right? <laughs> That's kind of the nature. It's, it's just a natural design. It's, an, it's a law of nature. Uh, the opposites, they get attracted. And uh, that's how you create a family. It's a completely natural thing. From that stems everything else. You really can't avoid that. You can't have, a, uh, you cannot build a country only with guys, for example, right? There have to be, there have to be women. Guys can play a certain role in that country, obviously. You know, they can be warriors, they can be hunter gatherers, they can be whatever, but they still have to, fam to have a, you know, a family with a woman who will actually then get the, the spoils of the war and share it and get the, you know, whatever you brought from the hunt and cook it, right? Things like that. Um, that's, that's why I consider family is extremely important. And I think Bitcoin also bring uh, brings uh, this uh, uh, tradition back um, from you know uh, from from sleep I guess uh, they, it uh, it it lowers your time preference in a way that, that you uh, you don't want to really spend a fortune right now because you know it's gonna get uh, it's gonna grow right so you want to make sure that your kids get it and then your kids hopefully, when if you know hopefully bitcoin exists uh, uh in that uh, future timeline as well they will pass it on to their kids uh so they will actually spend less and less and less because bitcoin just keeps uh growing growing and accumulating all the all the value in the world um so that uh, essentially uh, you remember how we talked about bitcoin rewiring your brain and uh, making you uh think in terms of a low time preference uh I think part of that brain rewiring is that it makes you want to have a family. It makes, because think about the high time preference lifestyle. What does it involve? It involves, uh, uh, you know, dating chicks. If you're a guy, you know, going to uh, clubs, uh, getting drunk, uh, or having parties and this and that. Uh, but uh, uh, let's contrast a family lifestyle to that, right? You're settled down. You have only one partner. You have kids. Uh, you have you have work that you like. Probably you uh, you think about the future, how to raise your kids. Uh, it's a completely different lifestyle. It's a lower time preference lifestyle, and I think that really really matters uh, in this regard. So that's how Bitcoin helps you. Um, I also uh, wrote some articles about how Bitcoin helps uh, family offices, but that's exactly the same topic. It's, it's it talks about exactly the same thing, but you don't have to have a family office. You don't have to be uh, a wealthy person to understand that uh, familial relationships are uh, something that uh, uh, something that brings uh, meaning into your life, right? It doesn't burn your life as the high time preference uh, lifestyle that most people go through when they are in their teens or twenties, or some people go through until they die. Right. Yuri, <laughs> I've enjoyed this conversation uh, immensely. I'm so glad I came across your work um, late this year. Uh, I wish I found it earlier. You're really, you're getting into a lot of the things that I think are uh, the, the forefront of my mind. And I think the biggest questions for 2021 um, really kind of taking almost flag theory uh, to a, a different level and, and combining it with Bitcoin in an interesting way. Um, a lot of things we didn't go deep, deep, deep on, and we, we touched on a lot of your work, but there's so much more, you know, divide and rule, scientism, um, uh, you know, uh, children of the Citadel, generation Bitcoin, and, and what I think is um, really, I think you're the champion of the Citadel. And, and that's just kind of how it bleeds into all this stuff. So, you know, where can everyone find you and your work and your awesome podcast and your blog? Um, and please let everyone know. Uh, sure. Uh, my website is degaya.co. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, y underscore degaya. And my podcast is called Citadelium. It comes from the world Citadel. Uh, and uh, you can find it pretty much on any major uh, platform like Spotify, YouTube, uh, uh, even BitChute uh, and Anchor.fm. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's where I am. And where else? Uh, uh, Twitter? Did you give the Twitter handle? Yes, y underscore the guy. Awesome, Yuri. This has been so dope. I appreciate it so much. I, I can't wait to have you back. I got many more questions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Cedric, for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to being back. Likewise. Talk soon. Yuri Degaya on kingdoms, monarchies, and building your inner citadel 
right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the chat with Yuri, please subscribe, like, and review my new YouTube channel and wherever you dome your pods. Those reviews are the best way to get the word out so I can keep grinding out thought-provoking conversations on Bitcoin and money. And if you're interested in sponsoring the show or just want to shoot the shit about Bitcoin, hit me up. My DMs are always open. This is Cedric. Peace.